Well, good morning, and as always, I'm glad to be before you once again. If you would, be turning over to the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew. Our text will come from this chapter, for in it we find one of our Lord's many promises that he made to us, specifically at the time, his disciples. This particular promise is of great importance. In fact, the song we just sang, I would say, very well sets up the topic of discussion this morning. Even though we didn't coordinate, it worked out rather well. We find in this passage of Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18, the promise of an institution that Jesus himself promised to build, and that not even death, or as it's rendered in the King James, Hades, would prevent. It would be founded in spite of death, or Hades, and we can read about this promise, and we'll do so now. Beginning again, verse 13. It says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So as we've just read, we see the Lord questioning his apostles regarding his identity. He was met with the answer of, well, the some say, the some sayers. But eventually, Peter would answer correctly. We find his response. He was able to make this answer based on the sufficient evidence that had been provided to him throughout the, the Lord's earthly ministry. And then we see in verse 18 that our Lord made this promise before them all. So at this time, I would like for us to discuss and study out this promised institution, that is, the Lord's church. First, we need to consider that Christ would found or build this church. Christ would. His statement is, I will build my church. The second person of the Godhead promised to build this church. Jesus Christ was God in the form of man. He came to the earth. And as such, this church, this entity, this new organism, would be a divine entity. Everything about this institution, then, would be exactly how Christ would prescribe. Its faith, its doctrine, its practice, its organization, its worship, its unity, even its very terms of interest. All of these things would be dictated by its divine builder. Thus the church would be perfect in every single way. It cannot be improved upon, especially by mere mortal man. He later says, as we've quoted, I will build my church. You see, this shows possession. It is Christ's church. It is his church because he built it. And it is his church because he paid the price for it. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. In the warning to the elders there, it says, Take ye therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which Jesus hath purchased with his own blood. 
So he paid the purchase price for this new entity, new at the time. Thus the phrase Church of Christ is not a title, but rather a statement of ownership. Again, it is Christ's church. Secondly, we need to consider what the church is not. The church was not built upon Peter. In our text, Jesus says, Upon this rock I will build my church. In this passage, there are three Greek words that we need to note. We must consider them. Petros, which is translated as Peter, which means a rock or even a piece of rock or a stone. Then you have Petros, which is translated in our King James Version as the word rock. But it means a massive rock or a bedrock or a stone ledge. And then you have the Greek word ekklesia, which is translated in our rendering as church. And it simply means an assembly called together or a congregation. It refers to the, sim the assembly of the Lord's people called out in a spiritual sense from the world. So those who claim that the church, as we read about in Matthew 16, was built upon Peter... And they claim this because they attempt to distort Matthew 16, verse 18. What they would have it read is as follows. Peter, thou art a rock, and upon you I will build my church. The Catholic Church subscribes to this line of thinking. With this line of thinking, however, Peter then would now be elevated above the apostles. And you can see that as part of their doctrine even elevated above Christ himself. Because after all, the church is founded upon Peter in their line of thinking. However, that is not what the Bible actually says. When you put these three Greek worm, words together, the verse properly rendered then would be, And I say unto thee, Thou art a stone, and upon this bedrock I will build my assembly. That's pretty simple. It becomes rather clear that Jesus was not referring to Peter by employing the Greek word Petros. What then is this bedrock foundation for the church? What is this adequate foundation for God or for the Lord's assembly? It must be the confession that Peter himself made. The acknowledgement of the fact that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, the very Son of God. Jesus is not merely a good man as some might believe. He is deity in the flesh. Based upon the, con the construction of this verse, the following must be true. Christ is the divine builder of the church. The truth that Jesus is the Son of God is the foundation. And Peter is simply one of many building blocks for this great spiritual structure. After all, who wants to build their house on a small rock? We often sing with the kids on the last Sundays. The wise man built his house on what? A rock. What did the foolish man build his house on? The sand. If you want a pathetic structure, you're not going to build it on a strong, stable rock. Well, apply that to the Catholic Church and any other institution that claims that Peter is the foundation for that institution. It won't stand. Now let's consider some evidence from other passages of Scripture. In Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, this concept was prophesied about Jesus hundreds of years before he came in the flesh. It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. 
a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Again, that's Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. I think it interesting that Peter himself refers to this passage in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. He says there, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, an holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded, or rather put to shame. Peter himself referred to Isaiah chapter 28, and who did he apply it to? Himself? No, he applied it to Jesus Christ. Paul would later pen in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, the following. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Cephas, Peter, no, which is Jesus Christ. Some other scriptures to consider would be Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. It is quite clear from the evidence we found in scripture that the church that Jesus spoke about is not founded upon Peter, a mere mortal man but rather the bedrock ledge of the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Next we note that Christ promised to build only one church. Jesus said he would build his church, singular. There would be but one religious entity made by him. It would be distinguished by name, doctrine and practice the new testament emphasizes er, emphasizes the oneness of this entity this church the church is the body of christ ephesians chapter 1 verses 22 and 23 which reads and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all how many bodies does Jesus have? Obviously it's one. How many churches did Jesus promise to build, the which he's over? Still just one. We know from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 20, and verse 27, that this body is made up of many members. Singular body made up of many members says there, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and hath been, made, or hath been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the head, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? 
But now are they many members, yet one body. And then again, dropping down to verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 20, and verse 27. Just as our human bodies are made up of many component parts, yet remains one body. This concept, as we've just read, is made to apply to the body of Christ, that spiritual entity. How many acceptable bodies are there to God? The same number of acceptable lords there are to God. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body, there is one Lord. Now what about the use of the word church in the plural form? I've had this asked of me before, specifically from Romans chapter 16, verse 16, where it says, the churches of Christ salute you. And in studying with this individual, they pointed out, well, these are different denominations. These different churches, they're saluting you. Is the church, the divine institution which we're studying, is it in fact a collection of many different denominations? You see, many would affirm this concept today. The fact is that each denomination, denomination teaches a variation and oftentimes an opposing view of not only salvation but in terms of interest, entrance and even worship as well as many other things. You think of faith only salvation. Well, they also teach grace only. Well, that's one too many onlys. So which one is it? How can each one of these false religions be a component of the one true church? If you add error to error, do you eventually arrive at the truth? No, that makes no sense. If a statement is mostly true, but yet has a small falsehood in that statement, is the entire statement true? Even a public school education will tell you that that statement is false. And I know there are many students that have gotten questions like that wrong, myself being one of them, because that true-false statement is kind of worded strange. I've tried to learn better since then. But you know, any statement that contains a small portion of falsehood is still a false statement. Any religious entity then that teaches any kind of error, especially regarding the church itself, is false. Truth can never imply error. Truth can never imply error. Now, each of these denominations, pick one, they were founded by a mere mortal human. Thus, they have absolutely no divine authority to exist in the first place. Furthermore, God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Instead, he is of peace as in all churches of the saints. You see, from this verse, not only do we, do we remove the error aspect of it, the confusion because of the denominations, but he references to all the churches of saints. Each church contemplated here contains saints. There is no saint found in any denomination. Saints are Christians. Christians are only in the Lord's collective assembly. That ecclesia we referenced earlier. The point here is that the Lord's church is a worldwide institution. And while a Christian is a member of that one church, that one body of the saved, he or she is also a member of a congregation in a certain geographical location. A group of Christians within close proximity is also referred to as a church, the local assembly of the Lord's people. 
Thus you have church being used in a local sense and in a universal sense or a worldwide sense. So these who are saluting the saluting churches of Romans chapter 16, these simply refer to various assemblies of Christians greeting the church at Rome. They're not different denominations. They're different assemblies of Christians within geographical locations. And they are collectively greeting their brethren at Rome. Now fourth, we must consider what exactly Jesus had in mind when he was going to build this assembly. What did he have in mind when he did build it? We find in the New Testament several different viewpoints of this church, of this divine organism. First and most commonly used is the term the church. This refers to its relationship with the world. We've already discussed what ecclesia means and it refers to those who have been called out. The church then, and therefore each and every member of it, are distinct from the world. They have been called by the gospel and even further they have obeyed the gospel. John chapter 15 verses 15 through 21 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, which reads as follows. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold, th hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. The gospel calls men to be saved. People who have willingly obeyed that gospel are members of this church. And by doing so, they are separate from the world. They no longer act like the world. They no longer talk like those of the world. Just look around. Everyone in this assembly is not doing the same things right now as the world would be doing. I'm sure there's some kind of sports game on TV. It's fairly cool outside, so the fish might be biting. And it's always kind of nice to sleep in sometimes. But those who have been called out Christians have an obligation to God. They have an obligation to gather with other Christians and worship God in spirit and in truth. A second viewpoint would be the kingdom. This refers to the church's government, this divine entity's government. You see, Christ is an absolute monarch. In him are vested all departments of government. You have the legislative, he brought mankind the will of God, and it's recorded in the New Testament for us to follow. We can know it. You have the executive. Jesus is the executor of the Father's will. He performed the very, the very will of God. And then you have the judicial, judicial. Jesus Christ will be our righteous judge. In our text this morning, in Matthew chapter 16, in describing the entity that he would go on to build, he refers to it as both the church and the kingdom. He refers to the same institution, and that is plain just by reading the text. It is his institution, both church and kingdom. We can also refer to Luke chapter 22, verses 29 and 30, and Hebrews chapter 12, verses 23 through 28. To be in the church of Christ is to be in the kingdom of Christ, and vice versa. Next, we consider the aspect of the body. This refers to its organization. As we've read, Christ is the head of this body. Christians are members of that body. 
Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12, uh, verse 12 through 20 and 27, which we read earlier. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, as well as chapter 5, verse 23. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Paul penned, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. You see, we try to take care of our own bodies. Our head basically operates the different functions that we have. That's expected of us in a spiritual sense. Christ is the head. As members, we're supposed to take care of each other. It's a very simple illustration, but one that we can all relate to. Fourth, the house of God. This refers to the relationship that each member or each Christian has to each other as well as with God the Father. All Christians are members of God's great spiritual family. Romans chapter 6 verses 14 through 17. Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 through 6. And 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. He says there, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I reckon we've all heard to one extent or another that we're supposed to act a certain way in our, in our house. Otherwise, mom and daddy are going to get after us with a belt, maybe a switch, and rightly so. There's a certain way we're expected to behave within our house as members of a physical family. God expects us to act a certain way within his spiritual family. And the preceding verses we've referenced is really one aspect of how we're supposed to help each other as spiritual members of that family. Next, we have the temple of God. This refers to its aspect of worship. You see, God dwells in this building, not this physical building, but the temple of God. It is here where he is worshipped by each member. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, as well as chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through 18 says there, then, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Note that the temple of God, the church, is not a material building. It is not brick and mortar. Acts chapter 7, verse 48, as well as chapter 17, verse 24. But rather, it is a spiritual temple. Church in the New Testament, that term never refers to a physical temple structure. You have the church meeting in physical places, but the church itself is not a physical structure. Now oftentimes folks say that they're going to church, or we will be going to church. And I know there's some folks that take offense to that, and they refer to this type of thinking here that the church is not a physical building. But what does the word church mean? It means the assembly. I am going to the assembly. Now, I do say that we need to be careful in how we use terms. 
We don't want to confuse the Lord's church with a physical building, but we are going to an assembly, an assembly of the Lord's people. And that would be an appropriate way to use that term. Next, we consider the bride. This term refers to relationship of the church to Jesus himself. Jesus gave his life so that his bride might live. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23 through 32. Now that passage there lines out what God expects the husband and wife to be. He outlines what each of them are supposed to be not only to one another, but to God. The apostle there, and really the Holy Spirit, is making the application you know that this is how God expects a married couple to behave. This is the same relationship that Jesus has to the church. He took something that they all knew about, they were familiar with, and he made a spiritual application to a spiritual institution. You see, Jesus protected the church. He gave his life for it so that she might live. And she lives today. Even later on in the book of Acts, when Jesus comes to Saul of Tarsus, he accuses uh, Saul of persecuting the church, persecuting me, the Lord. Well, what was Paul doing? What was Saul doing? He was murdering, having Christians murdered. He was taking them to prison. Jesus took offense to that, personal offense. You see, Saul of Tar Tarsus was attacking his bride. And I dare say there's many today that are still attacking his bride in various ways. And we as members of the church, members of the Lord's army, need to be prepared to defend against such attacks and to defeat our enemies where they stand. Now, we're not talking about a physical warfare, spiritual battles. We fight with logic, with the word of God, the spirit the sword of the spirit. Now in this relationship of the bride to Christ, it only follows that each member of this church bears his name. And that name is Christian. Acts chapter 11 verse 26. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 16. And Acts chapter 26, after Paul is giving his defense, he makes this claim. Verses 26 through 28. Speaking to the king there, Festus, he says, For the king knoweth of these things, of the things that Paul had been discussing, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from thee, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou hast persuaded to me, me to be a what? A Christian. Paul presented evidence and the conclusion that King Agrippa ar arrived at, I need to be a Christian. But it's not convenient for me right now. Almost thou hast persuaded me to be a Christian. He still held on to some things that he didn't want to give up. Now as we draw to a close, we have studied about the church, the divine institution that Jesus Christ promised to build. We know that he was successful in doing so. Acts chapter 2 verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Saved people were added by the Lord to the church. If it did not exist, to what would he be adding saved people? It makes absolutely no sense for our Lord to add people to an institution that did not exist at the time that he said this. The church then found upon the, new pa the pages of the New Testament is the only group 
of saved people today. Now, if you are not a member of this great spiritual body, why not become one today? The New Testament is rather clear regarding the terms of interest. Jesus has prescribed how one enters the church. Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31 says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And then Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13 but what saith it? The, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Calling upon the name of the Lord refers to the act of baptism. That's how we call on the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 22 verse 16. In order to become a Christian, in a lot of the passage that we just read... One must hear, believe, repent, confess Christ before others, and ultimately be immersed in water, baptized for the remission of sins. This is a simple process. It does take courage. But this, these are the steps that one must follow. Everyone must follow if they are to become a Christian. And at that point, they are simultaneously added to the Lord's church. The church that Christ built. The church that we've studied about this morning. Now living a life of humble obedience to God through His will will grant one eternal life in heaven when this life in the flesh is over. Now what if you are already a member of the church yet through weakness, perhaps ignorance, you've allowed sin back into your life? Repentance, confession, and prayer will restore you to a proper relationship between you and your God. If you need to obey the gospel in any of these ways, why wait? Take this time now as it's offered as together we stand and sing. <laughs>